Um, okay, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you again to Afshin, Katie, Michelle, for bringing us all together um, to speak about this, you know, in incredibly important issue and try to resolve, I think, you know, what exactly um, or potentially what law could play, what role law could play in contributing to the avoidance of extinction. Um, <clears throat> I would like to just carry on with an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm here at Macquarie University and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamatagal clan of the Darug Nation. Um, I pay respect to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Um, so in this session, which is entitled Seeing Extinction, I've had a look obviously at all the abstracts. I'm uh, familiarized myself with the work of the three participants. Uh, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. I think looking at the, the use of the word seeing, the term seeing, we're going to see a, a very literal, conceptual, and emotional interpretation of this term. I think we can see that as well in the, some of the titles of the um, papers, Tom with Unseeing Extinction, Michelle with uh, Extinction Hidden in Plain Sight. So I think that um, this idea of unveiling what extinction could really mean is going to be very critical, especially at this time in the workshop. Um, so the three speakers, I'll just quickly uh, introduce them all. Uh, we have uh, Tom Van Doren uh, from the University of Sydney, Michelle Lim and Alexandra McEwen. I'll give um, uh, profiles of, of each of you uh, immediately prior to your talk. Um, and I'll also allow you guys to um, probably give the fun facts about yourself uh, personally. I don't think I want to speak on your behalf. Um, okay, so I'll just uh, follow Afshin's lead. Uh, we'll have questions uh, after each speaker has concluded. And for each of you at the 15 minute mark, I'll just put up that. Uh, when you have two minutes to go, that, okay? All good. All right, so um, the first speaker we have is uh, Tom from the University of Sydney, as I said. Um, so Tom is an Associate Professor an Australian Research Council Future Fellow in the School of Philosophical and Historical uh, Inquiry at the Sydney Environment Institute. Uh, he's also a, um, is it second professor or professor two, Tom? I'm not sure how that's meant to be pronounced, I apologize. Professor two, I think. Okay, professor two in the Oslo School of Environmental Humanities. Uh, Tom has published extensively uh, on the topic of extinction. Um, some of the um, titles that I think we're probably all familiar with, uh, Flightways, Life and Loss at the Edge of Extinction, uh, The Wake of Crows, Living and Dying in Shared Worlds. He's also co-editor of Extinction Studies, Stories of Time, Death and Generations. Um, okay, um, Tom, I'll pass over to you. Right, thanks very much, Paul. Um, and thanks so much to, to the organizers um, for, well, for everything. It's been a great discussion so far and I'm um, looking forward to more. Um, so I'll just start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Gunungurra and Darug people in the Blue Mountains in Australia and just outside Sydney. Um, uh, and, but the stories I wanna share with you um, today or tonight, depending on where you are, are um, from a different colonized land, from Hawaii. And so I'd like to also acknowledge um, the, the indigenous people of those lands, the Kanaka Maoli, and their ongoing efforts to Malama Aina to, to care for the land. Um, so I'll jump in because I'm going to be close to time. So each new drawer we opened revealed another set of wonders, another surprising colour or variation in shape or size. In one drawer we encountered the cone shells of Corellia terricula, a now extinct ground dwelling snail that's thought to have once been the largest in the Hawaiian Islands. In another drawer, the tiny, delicate, translucent forms of Succinia lumbalis. In many others, we encountered the glossy, colourful forms of the Acatonella snails, some with bands and stripes, others patterned in ways reminiscent of tweed or tortoise shell. Drawer after drawer, ca cabinet after cabinet, row after row, we moved through the Malacology collection of the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, ultimately only seeing a tiny fraction of the shells held there. My guide was Nori Jung, manager of this incredible repository of over six million snail shells from all over Hawaii and the broader Pacific region. I'd asked Nori to show me the collection and tell me about its history and significance. 
In particular, I wanted to speak to her about her taxonomic research, an effort to create a comprehensive inventory of snail life in the Hawaiian Islands, drawing on this remarkable collection of shells uh, and a broad array of other resources. Nori and her partner Ken and their colleagues are working to determine just how many Hawaiian snail species there once were, as well as how many of them are left. It's not well known that amongst its many biological riches, Hawaii is a land of snails. While snails can be found all over the world, indeed they inhabit every continent and island archipelago outside the Arctic, very few other places supported anything like the variety found in this particular island chain. To date, 754 species of Hawaiian land snails have been officially described, but this number is subject to ongoing change, both as new species are discovered and as species formally identified, some of them well over 100 years ago, are revised. The actual number is thought by most scientists working in the area to probably be somewhere in the region of a thousand species. But even at 754, the tiny patches of land that form these islands were once home to roughly two thirds the number of snail species that can be found in the whole of continental North America, a land mass about 1700 times the size. What's more, almost all of Hawaii species, about 99%, were endemic to these islands, found nowhere else. By any reckoning, Hawaii is a remarkable place when it comes to snails. Sadly, however, this museum collection is now the only place that most of these species, or rather their shells, can still be seen. Of the 754 described species, roughly 450 are thought to already be extinct, the majority of them having been lost in the past 100 years or so. The most comprehensive picture of the snail situation in Hawaii has been produced by Nori, Ken and their colleagues, drawing on thousands of hours in the field, looking for snails at sites throughout the island, informed islands, sorry, informed by historical survey material held in the, this museum and others around the world. Equally as concerning as the species already lost though, this preliminary survey work has shown that the remaining 300 species are in a great deal of trouble. Of the, those 300, over 100 are critically imperiled, reduced to a single known population. A further 120 species are down to just two or three populations. This research shows that a grand total of 11 species can be categorized as stable. The causes of this decline are complex. In the past, Hawaii snails suffered from extensive habitat loss as land was cleared for farming and ranching as well as urban, tourist and military developments. For a hundred years or so, beginning shortly after the arrival of Europeans and Americans, a shell collecting craze also decimated many species, a period that some locals at the time referred to as land shell fever, and a period that somewhat ironically contributed many of the shells now held in the Bishop Museum and elsewhere that are today providing vital information about snail decline and conservation. Those species remaining today are threatened primarily by introduced predators, including rats, chameleons, and most significantly of all, a carnivorous snail, Euglandina rosea, which tracks the slime trails of the local species to consume them with a disturbing efficiency. Talking to staff at the Bishop Museum, I got my first real sense of the invertebrate bias at the heart of our current biodiversity crisis. It's difficult to adequately express just how little we know about the crawling, buzzing, fluttering, creeping, and of course, sliming world of invertebrate creatures around us. In part, this is simply a question of their sheer voluminous diversity. Invertebrates make up the vast majority of the animal kingdom, probably somewhere in the order of 99%. But it's also a question of interest and research focus. Despite their much smaller numbers, a tiny subsection of the planet's vertebrate species attracts the vast majority of the funding, both for basic research and for conservation. As a result, most of the world's invertebrates have not been described by science. We don't have any hard numbers to rely on here. We don't know how many species there are on the planet, nor do we know precisely how many have already been described because there is no single master list that we can consult. While estimates vary considerably, some reasonable working figures uh, that taxonomists have identified somewhere in the region of 1.75 million of the perhaps roughly 10 million species of plants, animals and fungi with which we share the planet. This leaves about 8 million unknown species, the majority of which are thought to be invertebrate animals, especially insects. 
these unknown species are not simply a puzzle for curious taxonomists. In our present time, a period that many are now describing as the sixth mass extinction event since complex life evolved on the planet, countless species that never quite managed to appear to us in the first place are disappearing forever. As Ken Hayes from the Bishop Museum explained to me, snails and other invertebrates present conservationists with a really difficult situation in this regard. He said, we don't know how to save them because we can't even name most of them. We don't have a name for them. We don't know if that's the same species as this one here. And if we can't name it, we can't tell you anything about its biology. We can't tell you how many offspring it has per year. We don't know how it mates. We don't know what it eats. We know almost nothing about them. Of course, merely having a name for a species, having officially described it, uh, in no way guarantees any kind of meaningful understanding. The division between the known and the unknown is not a black and white one, but a space comprised of many gradations of gray. As the biologist Alain de Bois has noted, it would be misleading to consider that these 1.75 million named species are known to science. Actually, many of them in an unknown proportion have only been the subject of a single scientific publication, providing the original description of the type specimen and, scarce, uh, and are scarcely more than mere nomina on lists. As a result, amongst those species that have been described, most lack the data to allow their conservation status to be assessed. One study found that while the status of 90% of mammals, birds and amphibians has been evaluated, amongst the described mollusks, the figure was 3%, and they're one of the best studied invertebrate groups, with the figure for insects being closer to 0.08%. This means, as Nori summed it up, the conservation status of fewer than 1% of the world's invertebrate species has been assessed. For all of the others, we just don't know enough to say how they're doing. The simple reality is that systems like the IUCN Red List were not designed for invertebrates. Mollusks had to wait until 1983, about 20 years after its establishment, to be included at all. They, like the other invertebrates, plants and fungi, are, as one eminent group of scientists succinctly put it, grossly underrepresented in its listing. A large part of the issue is that the Red List assessment requires detailed information on a species range and demography, with surveys repeated over time to show trends. In the vast majority of cases, this is simply information that we do not have for invertebrates. Even amongst listed species though, our knowledge of the invertebrates is generally much thinner. There are roughly 12 times fewer conservation papers published on the average listed invertebrate species as compared to the average listed vertebrate. Of course, this kind of bias is not an IUCN specific problem. The simple fact is that invertebrates very rarely receive anything like parity in research attention, funding, or public interest. We see this at every level of government, in NGO priorities, at the zoo, in our biodiversity education. Ultimately, this situation also means that even if an invertebrate species is able to jump all of the hurdles to be formally listed as endangered, it is that much less likely to receive the kind of public support and interest that leads to funding and conservation success. Snails and other invertebrates suffer from a kind of threefold ignorance here. We don't know most species. Those we do know, we often don't have the data to list as threatened. Even if they are listed, we often don't know enough about them to really conserve them. Underlying all of this is the fact that the public in general terms don't seem to really care about most invertebrates, whether they're named, described or listed. Indifference and ignorance feed into one another, reinforcing each other and driving the relentless loss of invertebrate diversity around the world. Back at the Bishop Museum, uh, not all of the snail shells that are held there are to be found in the Malacology Collection's carefully organised and labelled cabinets. In dark corners and cupboards, other shells are waiting. Some of them, Nori told me, were collected over 100 years ago. Some were donated by private collectors. Others were gathered on museum expeditions. Either way, they arrived without the time or resources to adequately catalogue them. These shells now sit in cardboard boxes, old mason jars, and an assortment of other containers. Importantly, there are without, without doubt numerous new species, unknown to science, waiting to be described amongst these shells. We should expect, however, that when and if these species are one day described, most of them will already be extinct when this happens. 
Their shells will serve only as an announcement of a loss that was not known at the time. Indeed, over roughly the past decade or so, a number of concrete examples have emerged of recent snail extinctions of previously unknown species. Some of these species have been discovered through specimens in museum collections. Others have been discovered as shells deposited in the landscape. In one recent study, nine new species from the Gambia Islands of French Polynesia were discovered. Shells from all of them had been collected in the 1930s and had sat undescribed within the Bishop Museum collection since. By the time they were described, however, follow-up surveys could find no trace of them in the environment. It's hard to make sense of these unknown extinctions of species that are discovered already lost. A species bursts into existence, ready to be named, described, perhaps even admired, but at the same time, it's already a former species, a lingering remnant like a shell, the only record of its having lived at all. We can make intuitive sense of it when these discoveries involve fossils, brontosaurus and mammoths that roamed the earth long before our time. But it's somehow, I think, a more unsettling prospect when these losses become contemporary companions. As odd as the phenomenon of unknown extinctions may seem though, it turns out to actually be the norm, indeed overwhelmingly so. When you think about it, how could things be otherwise? As I noted a moment ago, there are thought to be roughly five times as many undescribed species as there are described ones. Importantly, there's no reason to believe that these species are being spared the impacts of our current period of biodiversity loss. In fact, as Andy Purvis has argued, it's likely that if anything, undescribed species are being lost at a higher rate as they'll tend to have smaller geographical distributions, which is generally correlated with higher extinction risk and be disproportionately located in biodiversity hotspots, which are generally places of high habitat loss. Despite its being the norm though, I suspect this mode of extinction, the loss of the unknown, comes as something of a surprise, precisely because we are so fixated on the small portion of the animal kingdom that is well described. If we broaden our field of vision, we must acknowledge that for every named species that blinks out, perhaps not even with any fanfare, simply recognized as a species and therefore as an extinction, even if only by a handful of people, there are roughly another five extinctions that take place entirely unknown to us. We're living in the midst of an extinction crisis that's stripping innumerable species out of the world before we've even realized they're here. The incredible loss of diverse plants and animals that we know about, that we can name, that we can make some partial sense of, is only one side of the coin. While there is without doubt much that remains unseen, even actively ignored about all of the species that are being lost today, it's vital I think that we appreciate that there's something else going on here as well an unseen extinction crisis that is at once both larger and more thoroughly beyond the scope of our knowing. What's unique then about stories of snails that went extinct before discovery is not this fact in itself, but rather that their existence and extinction has come to be known about at all. In most cases, when the last of a species dies, especially an invertebrate species, all record of it vanishes with these individuals. But snails have a particular advantage over many other species when it comes to being discovered post-extinction. Unlike the majority of other invertebrates whose soft bodies mean that they frequently leave no earthly trace, snails possess a remarkable calciferous remainder. In their shells, they leave behind a record of their presence, even if a thoroughly imperfect and incomplete one. A snail shell is a miraculous thing. For hundreds of millions of years, snails have been wandering the planet, its oceans, rivers and lands, their fleshy, porous bodies protected by these sturdy calcium carbonate structures. These shells provide a record of a life. The apex or innermost point of the spiral um, is the oldest part of any shell. When a terrestrial snail is hatched or born, it begins life with this tiny shell. As it grows, it secretes calcium carbonate and other chemicals from its mantle to build up around the aperture and incrementally extend the outermost whirl of the shell. If you allow your eyes to trace the spiral pattern from apex to aperture, you're tracing the life history of this tiny being condensed into this solid form. In a variety of ways, these shells can be read to provide information about the lives they once contained. The thickness of a shell can vary depending on nutrition available in the environment, while periods of life in which growth ceased altogether can be marked with a scar called a varix. 
at a number at a much longer temporal scale, shells also record some of the features of the life of a species with specific adaptations reflecting things like the habitat they occupied, their dietary specialization, and the predators they lived amongst. For those who are able to read them, shells can not only announce the former presence of a now extinct species, they can also provide us with some important glimpses into its former existence. To be sure, other creatures can also leave important traces after extinction. With the aid of climate controlled museums, even the tiniest and most fragile species are now sometimes able to be discovered long after they've disappeared. But courtesy of their shells, snails are amongst that small club of invertebrates that don't require museums. As Ira Richling and Philippe Bouchot, the biologists who discovered the nine new snail species in the Gambia Islands have put it, documenting extinction when it takes place even before scientific collecting is limited essentially to vertebrates, snails, and to some extent crustaceans. These taxa have in common that they leave post-mortem remains bones, shells and carapaces that can be traced in the archaeological record or in discrete soil or cave horizons. This short paper begins and ends with snail shells and in this way it's an effort to impart a single modest idea. For me, Hawaii snails and in particular the huge repository of their shells at the Bishop Museum offered a powerful introduction to the worlds of taxonomy, of unknown diversity and of incredible loss, topics that I've only been able to touch on today. In so doing, these long gone snails and their lingering shells also called out to me to think with them, to tell their stories, to explore how these tiny beings might draw us into a fuller appreciation of some of the remarkable invertebrate creatures we share this world with. The hope that animates this short paper, along with much of my other work, is that snails perhaps more than any other living being, have the capacity to interrupt the pervasive phenomenon of unknown extinctions, to draw our attention towards and allow us to see previously unnoticed losses. As a highly diverse and highly threatened taxa with a durable remainder, snails find themselves positioned somewhere between the invertebrates and the vertebrates, possessing the abundance of species found amongst the former and the hard architecture of many of the latter. With a little luck and some dedicated effort on our part, this distinctive position might allow these humble gastropods to serve not only as an emblem, but potentially also as a powerful disruptor of our rapidly unfolding unseen extinction crisis. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ron. Okay, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Are there any questions uh, for Tom at the moment? Uh, Glenn, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, thanks, Tom. That was fantastic. And uh, I know so little about snails, or at least I did until um, 15, 20 minutes ago. So thank you. Um, uh, it reminded me of the work uh, that's been done on endemism in Western Australia amongst things like skinks, that it turns out that the diversity of skinks is incredible, uh, even over very small patches of uh, terrain. And uh, people like Steve Hopper have argued that as a result, we need to start thinking about the protection and conservation of places at tiny scales as well as at large scale, because it turns out that the diversity of, uh, of skinks is uh, so intense that uh, we, we lose species even over uh, very small areas in terms of square meters even. And so I wondered how you think about that comment or that thought with respect to the snails, that every, every square metre of what remains of their habitat has to be fought over just as fiercely as uh, the national parks and the larger spaces. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, I, did, I don't know that work at all, and that, but that seems very relevant to, to the snails. Um, I, I actually hadn't thought about it in, the, in those terms, so I'll, I'll definitely look that up. Um, but it's, yes, it's, it's the same situation in many ways, that, um, that, that endemism is really high and the, um, the, the range of some of these species, uh, some of them can be huge, um, but for, it can be like almost the whole of, a, of an island chain. Although in most cases, 
those are just species that haven't been revised in a while and when, and when they're looked at more closely mm -hmm. these days it's discovered they're actually a bunch of different species or they're determined to be um, for most of the yeah the recently described species um, especially the bigger ones um, like the colorful tree snails i had on a lot of my slides yeah they're, they're um, located uh, definitely within a single mountain range but often within a single valley um, within that range so um, that I think that makes a lot of sense and but I yeah I haven't heard about any real discussion of that in Hawaii I guess it's um it's probably pretty particular to to some uh, well to invert to many invertebrates or so, well I, yeah I hadn't thought of I hadn't thought of skinks in that category but snails fit in that category really well because they um, just their dispersal is just so low that they basically a lot of them spend their lives in the same tree um, so you, you can end up with very um, small ranges for these species. I would have thought skinks moved around a bit more, but I guess I just don't know enough about skinks. Well, apparently, I mean, these grey skinks that look the same almost all over Australia turn out to be incredibly diverse. And that one side of a granite outcrop will have what looks like an identical beastie on the other side. It turns out they're different species. So yeah, <laughs> it's an incredible... Um, uh, unfolding discovery that we're making of the the, the diversity of different species and uh, I yeah. thought that skinks and snails seem to fit into a very similar uh, well in this case island biogeography I mean southwest WA is a bit like an island and that a lot of the evolution has occurred over uh, in relative isolation from the rest of Australia over very long periods of time and obviously islands uh, do that uh, uh, consummately that's that's what island yeah. biogeography is all about yeah thanks glenn i might contact yeah, you, you for some references okay thanks glenn thanks tom um any other questions for tom before we pass over to michelle erin yeah thanks tom that was amazing um my question is really about whether this points to a need for environmental law to rethink the way that it's engaging with ecological communities and the scale at which we're actually protecting ecological communities. Because what I, what I took out of that was the fine scale um, and the tiny ranges that these, these species have. And I wonder whether that, like to me, that suggests we really need to rethink the way we relate to space and place through environmental law. Yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it on that level and I'm going to have to think more about the, the scalar questions there. I had sort of come at it a, a different way in, in thinking um, certainly about the, that there's something wrong with our species centric conservation regimes like endangered species lists and, and that what, just that way of thinking about what's at stake here when, when you know, over 80% of the Earth's biodiversity hasn't even been described, let alone assessed. Um, clearly that's not going to work. Um, so how, how do we go about conserving all of the species we don't even know about? Um, and there I think there's really interesting, um, there are already conversations going on in, in conservation biology and environmental philosophy and other places about um, wh whether those species-centric species regimes are helpful and, and what they miss and, and so on. And I think there's, um, um, I think it's too simple to just say well, we need ecosystem level um, responses. Um, at the very least, we need to still be cataloguing and uh, taxonomizing to know whether our, um, our ecosystem level approaches are having desired effects. Um, so I, I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of complicating factors there. Um, and I guess the, the question that Glenn asked that makes, um, would, would introduce these other scalar complications to the question of, of what an ecosystem how we define ecosystems and what and what level we what scalar level we're thinking about them at. Um, so I don't know what this means for environmental law. It's to be honest, it's something I hadn't thought a lot about until I started working on snails, having worked mostly on birds, where most of the taxonomy is pretty settled, um, at least on the, with the species I've been working on. Um, this is sort of a new terrain for me, and I guess I'm trying to grapple with um, all of these unknown species. I'd welcome suggestions about what this means for environmental law. Thanks, Erin. Okay, we probably have time for just one more question for Tom before we uh, move on. Anybody else? 
No. Uh, Tom, there's quite a few um, comments in the uh, chat box there. If you, um, I'll let you have a look um, uh, when you have a chance. Um, but yeah, thank you to everyone who's contributed there. Um, all right. So we will move on now to uh, Dr. Michelle Lim. Uh, Dr. Michelle Lim is a senior lecturer at Macquarie University School of Law. Um, Michelle's research occurs at the intersection of biodiversity conservation and sustainable livelihoods. Uh, she was a fellow on the Global Assessment of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, Michelle was also the 2016-2017 Law Council of Australia, Marla Perlman, uh, Australian Young Environmental Lawyer of the Year. Um, Michelle brings a very strong interdisciplinary uh, approach to environmental law and extinction in particular. So, um, Michelle, I'll pass over to you. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thank you too for all the incredible speakers we've had today. I'm seeing so many interconnections across um, the sorts of things we're talking about, but from very different perspectives. And thanks to Paul for acknowledging that we are on sovereign Wadamadigal land. And I too pay my respects to elders past and present. So today I'm asking the question, can endlings help us address environmental laws extinction problem? But what is an endling. An endling is the last of its kind, the final remaining individual of a plant or animal species. What's environmental law's extinction problem? Ultimately, it's that it not only fails to see the reality of extinction that we've been talking about already, but also the fact, and this has come up in discussion already too, that environmental law fails to feel the enormity of the trajectory towards the sixth mass extinction and also our contribution to setting Earth on this path. So Ursula Heiss, for example, writes that mass extinctions are extremely rare. They've occurred only five times previously in the 3.5 billion years of life on Earth and have never before been triggered by human agency. Today, I'm inviting you to sit with notions of the last, to grapple with unfettered human activity drawn to its logical and ultimate conclusion. My contention is this. If we are to inspire in humans truly transformative relationships with those who share our planet, we need to tap into deeply held values, including a sense of responsibility to care for the earth and all its beings. So today I'll be doing doing three things. First, I'll be talking more about environmental laws, extinction problem, which buries extinction in plain sight. I'll then be looking to endlings and their potential cultural power to perhaps inspire us to think anew about our legal, scientific and moral relationships with nature. And finally, I will attempt literally to see through the eyes of an endling. In this case, the final Christmas Island skink called Gump. So moving now to environmental laws extinction problem. Feel free to type into the chat box where in the Habitats Directive, which article of the Habitats Directive, the New Zealand Conservation Act, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the IHE targets, or even the draft post 2020 framework, where the phrase ex extinction appears. It's okay, it doesn't. And that's part of the point. The fact that we keep thinking about threatened species, protecting species, etc., but often environmental law perhaps fears to speak extinction's name. And by that, I'm not suggesting that there's an easy fix that if we include extinction in every piece of legislation, that our job is done. Philippa did an excellent job this morning of pointing out how extinction is articulated in our EPBC Act. It's also front and center of CITES. It's also a key part of the Endangered Species Act in the US. And yet, this is not enough. 
And the issue, the problem of listing has already been addressed across a range of presenters. And I'd like to come back to that issue because it is through that process of listing which has this preoccupation with categorization of extinction risk and buried in terms such as threatened, endangered, vulnerable, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in conservation management and in law, we've become so used to these terms that we forget what they actually mean. So if a species is threatened, we think of it as a threatened species and fail to engage with threatened with what? Of course, when we think about it, it's the fact that it's threatened with extinction, but the idea of extinction is very much buried into the background. And the process of listing also doesn't allow us to see extinction in its entirety, the drivers of extinction loss, which are closely related to our activities, to human activity. So if you take the EPBC Act, for example, it's largely there to prevent a discrete development project if it were to harm a threatened species. And as Katie was talking about this morning, um, how legislation, even where there's a huge risk of extinction, it's very much a project-based approach and doesn't really work particularly well. And this preoccupation with listing is also some of the key findings that came out of the recent Samuel review of the EPBC Act. And to add a few numbers to some of the things that uh, Leslie was talking about this morning, there are 1,890 listed species, 84 listed ecological communities, and of that, only 719 listed species have recovery plans and only 27 ecological communities have recovery plans. But even if a recovery plan, recovery plan were to be put in place, there's, and this is the words of the interim report, there's hardly any obligation to report on progress or actually focus on the outcomes achieved. Um, or, um, no requirement to implement or to ensure that the outcomes of preventing extinction are achieved. So this is what I mean by environmental law fa failing to see the problem of extinction. And at this point, I'll probably just cross-reference cross to Katie's paper who did an excellent job of dealing with the fact that law doesn't feel extinction. So Katie's discussion of empathy this morning, something that in law, we're almost trained out of thinking about. But this is compounded by the fact that science does the same thing, perhaps even more so than law. Um, my training is in law and in science. And as I was going through my degree, you're trained to be a good scientist, which essentially means removing yourself from feeling why you're engaged in ecology, why you're engaged in environmental law in the first place. So, that's part, the failure to see and the failure to feel are part of the problems I think we need to address if we are to do something to ameliorate the extinction trajectory that we're on. And this is where endlings come in because there's this grief, almost an unspeakable sadness that comes with reckoning with the final member of a species. So we give them names such as the thylacine that um, Philippa talked about this morning called Benjamin, Lonesome George, the final um, Pinta Island tortoise. We engage with them on a level that we perhaps don't at, um, when they aren't as close to extinction. So why do endlings no matter how otherwise uncharismatic, tug at our conscience. Why are we drawn to the plight of the endling at the point of biological and evolutionary futility? Is it the stark confrontation with the end point of our collective unsustainable actions? 
Uh, or is it the fact that rarity and fleetingness force us to look anew? And I suspect it's a combination of all of those reasons, but at the same time, the question of how do we harness the power of the endling at the point of evolutionary futility to then draw it back in time to go, well, actually, let's do something similar to what Leslie was talking about this morning. Let's do something before we get to that point when we can actually do something about it. And um, Dolly um, Janssen, for example, has, has explored the cultural power of the endling and in doing so cites Tom's work in talking about how um, the, the adoption of an endling to denote the final member of a species implies an ethical and emotional stake in the continued survival of a non-human species. So what I do in this paper is to try and draw this connection with the non-human to its logical conclusion, not only at extinction, but the final member of extinction, and then take a, perhaps a bit too literally this idea of seeing through the eyes of an endling. So in the paper, I tell stories through the eyes of a past, recent, and future endling. The past endling is Benjamin, the thylacine that I've just um, spoken about um, in the year 1936, the 7th of September, noting that it was declared a protected species in July of that year. And then the final one um, died in September. And the second story is on the 31st of May, 2014, the story that I will be sharing with you in a little bit of Gump, the Christmas Island skink, and the third story is, the first of Jan is on the 1st of January, 2050, the story of Mermi, the last numbat. Now I'm about to tell you, well, you're about to hear from Gump, the last Christmas Island um, skink. And with my apologies to both Katie and Tom for the vertebrate bias across each of these stories, which I am well aware of. And I chose the story of Gump partly because she just speaks to me, and also because perhaps this is a way to engage with less known, lesser known species. Numbat, very charismatic. Benjamin, the last thylacine. Everyone knows about Benjamin. So across the pieces, I take kind of like a documentary style. You first have a clip um, of the species in its um, natural habitat, if you like and then this interview style approach. So give me a second, I'm just going to find an extinct li lizard um, and then I'll, I'll come back and we can have a bit of a discussion with them. Gump, yeah, everyone's waiting for you. You ready? Yeah, good to go? Right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the 34th, 31st of May, 2014. We are on Christmas Island and I present to you Gump, Elvis impersonator and the last Christmas Island forest skink. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I do love performing that little number. Kind of reminds me of what's going on around me. You know what I mean. Today's my last day, you know. Yes, my last day on the island. Well, last day on the planet, actually. Yep, for me and all that came before. Not to be too dramatic, but today is the end of the line for Emoya nativitatis. Yes. One more sleep and there will be no more Christmas Island forest skink on this earth. Don't let that get you down. 
Let's play some music, shall we? A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Don't be cruel to a heart that's true. So at this point, the music fades and we enter into the interview with Gum. You know, when you're on stage, you can't let the mood get too sad. I mean, this gig is hard enough, being a woman in a male-dominated field of Elvis impersonation. I can't lie. This whole end of the line thing is getting to me. Yeah, it's lonely. Of course it's lonely. I don't think that's the worst of it. This predicament, I suppose you'd call it, forces you to do some deep thinking to the point when your brain and your heart can't deal anymore. It was hard enough when there was only three of us less. Just because I'm the last Christmas island skin, I'm not saying I'm special. We used to have these teeny tiny microbats on the island, huge lot of attitude. They were so little, it was hard to take them seriously. They were smaller than our kids. That's a funny name. Christmas Island Pipistrels brags me up even saying it. <laughs> yeah, they're gone now. Forever. August 2009 was the last time anyone saw one. And did you hear about them Bramble Key Malamies? I've seen pictures. I know some of you have too. Such a cute little mousy thing. They lived on a sandy island on the northern Great Barrier Reef. Well, until they didn't. Last one also seen in 2009. First mammal to go extinct due to climate change. Ah, climate change. We didn't even get the chance to test ourselves against climate change. Not that we didn't have enough to worry about. Those fucking yellow crazy ants, fucking crazy, I'll tell you. Them super colonies are giving the crabs a hard time too. Seen it happen, not nice. It's not their bite so much, but that spray. Whoosh, formic acid, <sighs> horrible stuff. My mate Jim, he was a forest skink, like me. One of the fastest runners I ever seen, but the spray got to him. Hey, you know what? Five months ago, I made it onto the National Threatened Species List. A big deal, maybe. I mean, they finally got around to adding me to the list, but here's the funny bit. The conservation advice, they seriously wrote it like any other conservation advice. Wait, wait for it, wait for us. It goes like this. A captive population of this species has been established in holding cages on Christmas Island. The captive population consists of one individual. I mean, hello, what? One individual makes a population nowadays? <laughs> you can't make this sort of thing up. The captive population consists of one individual. That's me, just poor old Gump, alone in the great big world. Maybe the geckos and the blue-tailed skink will be all right, maybe. I hear they have a captive breeding program going. That sounds like fun. They've also got recovery plans. We never had one. We were nominated, but I've heard talk that the skinks and the geckos, the blue-tailed skinks, will get to go out there again someday. But fat lot of good that'll do if they don't do something about the feral cats and those yellow crazy ants. And let's not mention what the heat means for all that and that the waters are rising. But what do I know? So we've heard today already about the work of John Wojnarski and in 2013 in a piece in the conversation he wrote, individually Gump is an undistinguished and un inconsequential lizard, but she has now become a talisman, marking the finality and proximity of extinction. Extinction is a chain. The last link of the chain is the death of the last individual. I want these stories of the last to lead not to despair, but instead of hope, to hope, to force us to think about the long chain of extinction, to make us engage with our culpability and moral responsibilities, perhaps in the way that Philippa was talking about this morning. 
but to engage long before the point of ecological and evolutionary futility. So towards the end of the piece, I consider the window of opportunity that remains for transformative change. I spoke earlier about how Murmi the number is the endling of 2050. At the end of the paper, I imagine a final shorter story, a story which imagines an alternate, better reality for Murmi, who in that alternate imagining is not the last number. The final hope from our conversation today is that somehow stories of the last might help us consider our place in the world, that we care about nature and it's in its entirety, long before it's rare, endangered, or the last of. Perhaps engaging with endlings and all the grief and reckoning this confrontation requires can be the catalyst which signals the urgency of reimagining the ways in which we legislate and interpret law, but more importantly, how we live. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Gump. Um, okay, so wow, <laughs> what a way to really, I think, portray the uh, issue of seeing extinction. Fantastic, thank you. Um, any questions for Michelle or Gump? Yeah, I had I had a question um, mm -hmm. for Michelle about the process of extinction. I was just thinking while you were speaking about the last rhino in Vietnam, um, and it was killed by a poacher. And when you were talking about the skink, I was thinking about um, the neglect of nothingness at the end of the skink's existence and the contrasting ways uh, of that um, extinction occurs and the kind of neglect versus active violence, so to speak. Do you have any comments about that? Michelle, microphone. <laughs> I was just saying how when you were talking about the rhino, I was then thinking about how the thylacine, um, again, it was an issue of neglect. And now we look back on the thylacine as this indicator of how we, we could have done something different. Um, and also this idea of neglect I think we need to look at it at a broader scale where it's not just going, oh, these, the keepers should have done something more. My hope is that perhaps these stories of the last ask all of us what more we can do and what more we could have done and what more we, we can do. And then now I'm thinking of Philippa's presentation of, of how that con coronial inquest inquiry is such a good idea because it's forcing us to do the reflection that's sorely needed and to to really address this 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 issue yes. thanks alexandra uh, anybody else have any questions or comments for michelle Um, I, I'd just like to say, wow, um, I think on behalf of everybody in this workshop right now. And thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. Um, yeah, I think that sums it up for everyone. Um, anyone else? Perhaps, um, if I may, just very briefly, um, just reflecting on the, the sort of similarities and differences between the um, story about the skink on Christmas Island and the thylacine in Tassie. Mm. Um, I, I feel a little bit, and I, I'm no expert on the thylacine, but I feel a little bit like the story for the thylacine was different to one of neglect. And in fact, the, the government had placed bounties on the thylacine um, and, and had kind of built a culture of persecution and removal and 
and management in the most dire sense. Um, and so there was quite, they had built up quite a culture of kind of killing thylacines. And it wasn't until it was too late that they realised that um, they were sort of on a track to something more than just the management of the species population, but actually to its extinction. And I just really, um, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's, I feel like there's two, I'm not articulating this very well at all, but I feel like there's two really different kinds of things going on with this idea of extinction. Um, sometimes when it happens, you know, remotely um, or, or in relation to snails and, and other invertebrates that we haven't named yet, for example, there's this kind of under the radar loss of the richness and the colour and the depth you know, of, of our context and our, our surrounds. But there's this other thing playing out with some extinctions where we see, um, you know, um, active, um, um, active act actions that like really active kind of behaviour against a species and mm. the extirpation purpose of a, of a particular species. And it's managing that from a legal perspective is really hard because that's all about people. That's not like we should have had a plan to go in there and do a thing. We should have had you know, a better approach to, to listing or to habitat management or whatever. That's actually like, uh, that's a question of how people feel about something and how we can shift perspectives, for example, about the role of invertebrates, their importance and their, that, that concept of wonder about their place in the, in the thread of things. I don't know. I mean, giving them a character is a really, potentially a pretty powerful tool for changing, you know, changing minds about their place in the system has real challenges for law, though. Do you want to respond, Tom, or go ahead? Yeah. Well, um, go from the from the <laughs> that I, yeah, I, I think it's really important the the points that you're you're touching on to recognise, um, and in some ways, this is getting away from your main point, but that this idea that there are many different ways in which species are being pushed towards extinction and that law, because it's so compartmentalized, even if you compare and contrast CITES and, and the CBD, one dealing with, you know, the active um, aim to stop the, the trade in species, the exploitation of species that way. And, but nowhere in between to go, actually there's a range of other ways in which we, we're not connecting how our activities link directly to these particular species. And I think what Tom's talking about, what, what I'm hearing what you're saying in terms of, uh, and what Tom's talking about as well, it makes me think of this idea of species are, does it matter? This, the question of does it matter that humans didn't know that a species went extinct? Is that extinction any less important? Um, how is, is extinction itself something that we should be ethically and, and morally be concerned about? So it's more questions rather than answers, but yes, really interesting questions that you're you're provoking. Okay, thanks, Philippa. Thanks, Michelle, again. Um, I'm sorry, Gump didn't get any <laughs> questions directed to him or her, but um, <laughs> we'll hopefully, um, I'm sure they'll get a writing credit in your paper anyway. <laughs>